Okay, welcome back to our discussion about the classical linear regression model and our, the assumptions that need to be true in order for the Gauss-Markov theorem to tell us that OLS is a good idea. Uh, assumption 4 here. You're starting to see that just about all of these assumptions have to do with the residual, right? That's why our discussions of the residual were so important before. So assumption 4 is that observations of the error term the error terms, the theoretical notion, the residuals are actually what we observe, but the uh, observations of the error term are uncorrelated with each other. Sometimes the fact that they are related we call serial correlation. And so here's a little graph uh, to illustrate what serial correlation does look like and what you don't want to see. Uh, perhaps you're in an economics class and you want to look at the relationship between GDP gross domestic product, and time. So this axis here is as we go through time, what's happening to GDP. And anytime you look at the gross domestic product of a country, you see business cycles. GDP goes up, goes down. Uh, you have an expansion and a contraction or a recession. So expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. And if you want to explain the relationship between time and GDP and what's happening, then if you do a regression, your line would probably look something like this. Now, serial correlation just means, are, is there a relationship? Are they related serially? Serial just means over time, or uh, as you look at the observations in any sort of order. You know, it, typically we think about this as being through time, although it doesn't really, strictly speaking, have to be. We'll look at a situation in a second where it's not time. Serial correlation means if I look at a particular observation, say this point right here, and the residual is positive because it's above the predicted line, does that tell me anything about other residuals. Well, yes it does. It tells me that these residuals that are near it are probably also positive. So by observing a, uh, the size of a residual, it tells you something about the size of the residuals that are near it. That's an example of serial correlation. Now similarly over here, the fact that we see a residual that is negative, it tells us that the other residuals near it are more likely to be also negative. So that's just what serial correlation is in a nutshell. What's the problem with this? You know, why would serial correlation not be a good idea? Well, it basically, I think about it in two ways. Now, let me change the, uh, change the color of this line so we can, we can look at it. Uh, let's see. Oh. Well, I'm just going to leave it brown. Um, it's a bad idea for a couple of reasons. The, the first reason is if knowing that a residual is positive tells you that the other ones around it are also positive, well, it kind of tells you that you're doing something silly. You're ignoring information that should be built into your model, right? If you know that uh, GDP goes up and then down and up and then down. Why don't you just build that into your model to begin with and take care of that? So that's one problem with it. A second problem is that if you have this kind of uh, relationship, then... Okay, I, I got the color to change there. If you have this kind of relationship, think about what would happen if you did not have all of this data through time. What if you wanted to estimate the relationship seen by the brown line, but you did not have uh, the points, these two points on the end here, and you didn't have these two points on the left end, right? Suppose you started observing this series in the middle. Well, let's just fit the points to the middle here ignoring the two points on either end, and you would get this relationship, right? So there are two problems. You know, if you know that there's a pattern in your residuals, change your model to include the pattern. Uh, because if you don't, 
especially if you don't observe enough points in the series, then you're going to get a really bad estimate of the slope by doing that. So those are two problems with it. Now, again, this is typically something that you think about as happening in time series data. You're looking at a, a relationship through time, but it doesn't have to be through time. Let me bring back uh, some of the data we were looking at in our second lecture when we were looking at modeling nonlinear relationships. And we were looking at the relationship between horsepower and miles per gallon and this is the line you estimate uh, for this scatter plot of data between horsepower and miles per gallon. Here we also see what you could call serial correlation because over in this region all of these residuals are positive. So observing a positive residual for a low horsepower car tells you that the other residuals near it are also probably positive over here all of these are positive and in the middle they're mostly negative so this is strictly speaking an example of serial correlation although I don't really call it serial correlation because I think it fits better under a another assumption which is you have the wrong functional form you're trying to model a curve with a straight line and so we're gonna look at R uh, when we get done with these assumptions and, and we're going to look at some plots like this uh, for when you're not looking at time series data you're gonna, looking at a cross-sectional relationship but you can see this pattern in the residuals when you plot them and so that's strictly speaking also could be called serial correlation now the next assumption also has to do with the residuals it's an assumption that the error term has constant variance which we call homoscedasticity. Homo meaning same. Scedasticity, think about that as meaning scattered, versus hetero, differently scattered. Heteroscedasticity. So this assumption of homoscedasticity means that, let's go back to our uh, additive error term discussion here. It means that when you use the y-intercept, and the slope and the observations of the variables to come up with a prediction for example 29 miles per gallon that's the prediction of the average value for an observation such as that and then you're supposed to go to your random number generator and that uh, random stochastic process pulls a random number out of a hat now that random number generator should be a, the exact same random process no matter what kind of observation you're looking at. It shouldn't matter if you're looking at a car with a little horsepower or a lot of horsepower, a domestic car or an import car. You should be using the exact same random number generating process to come up with these error terms these or, or residuals so that's what homoscedasticity means the residuals should have the same exact distribution for all individuals all types of observations no matter what but of course that's not what we see all the time and let me take you back to another relationship that we we looked at in our very first lecture, the relationship between the price of a car explained with horsepower. And if you look at the relationship here, you can very clearly see that for cars with low horsepower, that the distribution that we're drawing the stochastic error terms or the residuals we get to actually observe from the numbers, say, between 0 and 2 and then they're either positive or negative so here the distribution says well we're just drawing residuals from the numbers minus two to positive two thousand dollars in the middle we're drawing from a different distribution where these numbers are between minus ten and positive ten thousand dollars and on the very end on the right we have a third distribution 
that we are using to generate our stochastic error terms and they are between positive 30 and negative 30. And so that's heteroscedasticity, differently scattered in different regions. And it really doesn't matter what the cause is. It could be for any possible reason that we can detect a different uh, size of residuals for different types of os observations. It could be that domestic cars are generated from a normal distribution and the residuals for import cars are generated from a, an exponential distribution, for example. It doesn't matter. If there's any difference, this is a problem. And what the problem it really causes is not that it, we're going to end up with the wrong slope, it's that we're going to be misled into how confident we can be in that slope.